So Darwin's theory is very clear that evolution shapes sensory systems to guide adaptive behavior. And that's true. According to Darwin's theory, that is in fact true. Most of us think intuitively that to do that, evolution must shape us to see the truth, because clearly, if you see the truth, that will be much more adaptive than if you don't see the truth. So to guide adaptive behavior, evolution must also shape us to see the truth. And it turns out that that extra assumption, which isn't in Darwin's theory, um, shouldn't be in Darwin's theory. Now, it, the mathematics of it is, is very, very simple. The payoff functions that guide evolution. Like if you play a game, you have payoffs. If you make certain moves on, on the board game or in a video game, you get certain number of points. And if you get enough points, you can get to the next level of the game. If you don't get enough points in time, you die and so forth. Same thing like in evolution. There's the evolutionary game theory. You have payoffs that guide uh, adaptive uh, um, evolution. And what happens with those payoffs, they're, they're basically not telling you whether you, you, know, you go to the next level of the game, but whether your genes, your offspring, go to the next level of the game. So when you analyze those fitness payoffs and ask, um, do those fitness payoffs contain information about the true structure of objective reality? Right? If, if they're going to shape you, if the payoff functions that guide evolution are going to shape your sensory systems for you to see the truth, then they have to know a little bit about the truth themselves or they can't, they can't shape you. And what we've proven, and this is, again, work with um, not just me, but Chaitan Prakash and um, Manish Singh, Robert Prentner, and, and uh, Brian Marion and Justin Marks, so a number of other people, um, not just me. But we've shown is, is uh, in a number of ways that the payoff functions basically don't have the information, almost surely don't have the information about the structure of the world. So you can actually prove the probability is precisely zero that any payoff function has that information, and therefore, it's precisely zero probability that we've been shaped to see reality as it is. Now, uh, I should mention just two quick objections uh, that people have about this. Um, one is, I've shot myself in the foot, logically. Right? I've used evolutionary game theory, which is supposed to capture Darwin's theory of evolution. It's the mathematics of Darwin's theory. And I've used it to actually show that certain basic concepts in Darwin's theory, like real physical animals competing for real physical resources in a real space and time. I'm, I'm saying that all of that is, you know, space and time aren't fundamental. We're not seeing reality as it is. Objects in space time are just an illusion or a headset. So the argument from philosophers, some philosophers has been, well, uh, Hoffman, unfortunately, has shot himself in the foot. Logically, he's used evolutionary game theory mathematics to show that the very concepts that were gave rise to evolutionary game theory um, aren't true. So, so either the math faithfully represents Darwin's ideas and captures it and is a, is, a, is a good representation of those ideas, or it's not. If it's not, Hoffman couldn't use it for what he's using it for. And if it does, if it is a good faithful representation of Darwin's central ideas, then it couldn't possibly contradict them. So in either way, Hoffman is messed up, right? <laughs> and, his, and his team. <laughs> and, and the answer is this is fundamentally misunderstands the nature of scientific theories. Every theory makes assumptions. They're the miracles of the theory. And then it says, if you grant me those assumptions, I'll, show, I'll then prove all this or, or explain all this other wonderful stuff. But it never explains its assumptions. And you can get a new theory, a deeper theory that explains those assumptions, but it'll have its own new assumptions ad infinitum. So every theory has, if it's good enough, has a scope. But every theory no matter how good it is, has its limits. If none else, its assumptions are showing you what its limits are. So the only question is, when you have a mathematical representation of the theory, is the mathematics, if it's a good theory, the mathematics will help you explore the scope. That's you. Know, and, but if it's a great theory, the mathematics will actually show you precisely what the limits are. And in case of Einstein's theory of space-time, for example, uh, his mathematics is, of course, fantastic and GPS and everything else is based on Einstein's math. So, wonderful scope. But his theory also, the same mathematics that captures his theory and shows its scope, also tells us its limits. And the limits are, in Einstein's case, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Space-time ceases to have any um, operational meaning. 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And so here we have the case where the mathematics that Einstein came up with is the very mathematics that comes back and says, 
your fundamental concept of space and time fail at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So that's how science, good science, really works. The mathematics that's intended to capture the fundamental concepts of your theory, if it's great mathematics and a great theory, will come back and show you exactly what the limits are of those fundamental concepts. So that's not self-refutation. In, in fact, that's why science is so powerful. When we just use informal discussion and, you know, talking about ideas over you know, beer and so forth, that's one thing. But you can never find out the, the limit of your, of your ideas and the limits of your theories when you have just an informal theory. And as a result, it's easy to become dogmatic and to think that you're, you're getting close to a theory of everything, that I know the truth and you don't, and, and so forth. What science does is it puts a, a, a big dose of humility in there on even a, even a big theory like Einstein's theory of space time. It tells you that theory is great and it stops at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Game over. So you need new concepts. So that's so it's an anti-dogmatic kind of thing. So so that's sort of just a little the kind of pushback I've gotten on this, and you can see why it would be some strong pushback because what I'm saying is very very uncomfortable mm -hmm. that we don't see reality as it is. Yeah, and we'll circle back to the value of discovering the limits of different theories um, because I'm excited to dive into that to continue to you know, put a bow on the uh, high level overview of mm -hmm. the, this work, that understanding that you just shared in conjunction with local realism being proof false leads us to explore the headset analogy. Yes. And so, uh, what, you know, the Nobel Prize for local realism being proved false explains how objects in space time cease to exist when they're not perceived. Like they get rendered on the fly when they're perceived. Why does that become an important reflection when we start to dismantle this notion that reality is as it seems? Well, I, again, I should say that um, you know, local realism is, is, is false. The, the Nobel Prize was granted for it, um, for that experimental verification. There are some who still want to maintain some kind of realism through multiverse kinds of explanations and so forth. I think that we just have to bite the bullet and say space and time aren't fundamental. Yeah. And the properties of objects in space and time aren't fundamental. Uh, so, so, so that's the direction I'm going. But I just want to point out that there are very, very bright physicists who, who would disagree. Uh, now, the, the theory of evolution by natural selection and the, uh, my work on that is in some sense, um, it, it suggests that space time is an interface, right? Yeah, so it does, it strongly suggests that what evolution gave us was not a window on the truth, but a, a headset that lets us play the game of life. And, and so that's why I think it does fit in with the, the modern results in physics. I think it's very a very reasonable interpretation of modern quantum theory, and, and it's actually part of, for example, um, a big interpretation, the so-called cubism interpretation of quantum theory that uh, um, Chris Fuchs and, and, uh, and others are, are, are espousing. That, that the quantum state is just the observer's statement of the degrees of belief of what they will experience if they make certain kinds of observations. And it's it's not, you know, quantum states are not descriptions of objective reality. They're descriptions of your degrees of subjective belief. So so I think that that, that fits very, very well with, with the work I'm saying. And so here's a case where physics, this interpretation of physics, the cubist interpretation of physics, the non-local realist uh, uh, in, interpretation of, of, of quantum physics works very, very well with what evolution is suggesting, that, that we evolved not to see the truth, but to have a headset. So, so yeah, I think that the two actually dovetail quite well. Truth to be hidden, but allowing us to control it in a way that we need. That, that's, that's exactly right. And, and I should mention that... Uh, since the last time we talked, there has been a big push by the European Research Council, the ERC. They have a 10 million euro new initiative for finding that there, there are these new structures outside of space-time. Like amplitudehedron? Like the amplitudehedron, right. Yeah, that's right. So they're called positive geometries. But, and so they, it's just started. Is it a, co it's a cosmological polytope, is that correct? That's right, that's right, an associahedra and, and, and so forth. So there, so there are these positive geometries and, and they could have billions of dimensions. Space-time has four, <laughs> maybe 11 in string theory or something like that. But, but they could have billions of dimensions. In other words, 
our, our headset is pretty cheap. Yeah. It's a really, really low dimensional. We, we got the, you know, the cheap model. <laughs> the physics, the, I mean, the high energy theoretical physicists are now looking at, at structures like the amplitude hedron, in which one of the parameters is the dimension of your space time. So in our case, M equals four. M is the parameter of the, and ours is four, but they could have a billion. M could be any number, any, so M is one of the, you know, four is one of the smaller numbers you could have. So, so it, that's already a parameter in the positive geometries that, oh yeah, your headset, you know, your space time could be as many dimensions as you want. And, and we have about as cheap of one as you could get away with. So, so instead of us having a theory of everything, we have a theory just of a trivial headset. So just refining again, the understanding that objects cease to exist in the form we think they do when they're not perceived. This goes for the chair that you're sitting on, the moon, any, any object that the quantum theories works at all scales, then this would apply to, to that at all scales. Can you just share a little bit more about the headset analogy and how that helps us kind of wrap our head around things exist in objective reality in a way that is analogous like we explored to last time, like a computer where there is gates of electricity moving, um, but the display of the screen is set to hide the truth of reality so we can control it in a way that is useful. Because otherwise, if we didn't have the display of a computer screen, like how would we actually effectively navigate it? Um, so could you elaborate on that a little bit more so we can wrap our head around that? <laughs> that that's right. So an obvious question is, if we don't see the truth, then what has evolution done? How does it allow us to survive yeah. when we're ignorant of what reality is? But if you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. If, if you have someone, say Grand Theft Auto, and it is a virtual reality version of Grand Theft Auto in multiplayer, and uh, there's some supercomputer somewhere that's, that's running it, and, but you don't know, you don't see that supercomputer, you don't need to know about the software and so forth. All, all I know is I've got a steering wheel in front of me, I've got a dashboard, I've got uh, uh, you know, a gas pedal and so forth, and I can see over to my right, I can see a green Ferrari or something like that that I'm racing against. Well. Of course, if you looked inside the supercomputer, there's no green Ferrari anywhere inside the supercomputer. And there's no steering wheel and, and none of that. The reality that I'm interacting with and th what I'm really doing in this metaphor, in, in that reality, is toggling millions of voltages in a precise order. It has to be, you get one toggle wrong and the, and the thing can crash. So you have to get this precise toggling of multi millions of voltages. That's what you're really doing in, in the reality. But if you had to do that to play the game, if you actually had to go in there and know what sequence of, of voltages to put in at what time, good luck. I, I'm going to win the game if I'm just turning my steering wheel and you know, slamming on the brakes and the gas and, and what. I'm, I'm going to win the game. So here's a case where it's very, very clear that knowing the reality and having to interface directly with the reality to play the game is going to make you lose as opposed to just having a, a, a dumb dumbed down user interface that hides the truth, but gives you just the controls you need. So that's the, sort of the, the point of view of evolution. Um, from, the, from the evolutionary point of view, Darwin's idea then is basically that evolution shaped us with sensory systems that hide all the truth that we don't need and all the gory details, just give us the, 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 the levers that we need to, to control reality without actually knowing what those levers do. So, because if you had all the stuff that you know, you're gonna have to pay for you know, more energy for all the neurons you're gonna to need to store that information, understand that stuff. It's just too expensive. So, so that's sort of an, an intuition where, where it starts to make it seem not so much crazy, but of course, of course you don't wanna see the truth, it's just too, too complicated.